Just a few announcements in the last minute or so before seven o'clock strikes. This is the one service of the year that we do not conclude with a benediction. And that's because this service doesn't really end tonight. We carry this service forward with us until Sunday morning. This one is going to be solemn. But Sunday morning, the ending is going to be dynamite. There's going to be a responsive reading this evening, but there are no bulletins, so if you are looking for the bulletin, it's okay. There isn't one. We're going to be reading Psalm 22, which is on page 860, if anyone has trouble finding that. But first, I'm going to read the call to worship. And first, before that, we're going to open in prayer. Father, on this, on this night, you know, we, we don't know the actual day, the actual date, when many of these events occurred. But this is the night that we remember. You're agony in the garden. This is the night when we remember the Last Supper, which gives us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. This is the night that we remember your decision, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, tonight we remember and we thank you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to take away from this evening the truth of how much you love us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our call to worship this evening is Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities, he carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of men and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Turning now to Psalm 22, we'll read responsively verse by verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me and from the words of my groaning? Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In your They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even in my mother's breast. From birth, I was the shaft behind you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there is no one to help. And many bulls surround me, strong bulls of passion encircle me. Roaring lions, tearing their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions, and save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers, and the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or sustained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For the community belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. Let's do the last verse together. 
they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen. It's not, I think, a mistake that this psalm comes immediately before Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. These two chapters that we read tonight are both Old Testament prophecies referring specifically to the death of the Messiah. They refer specifically to the events that we remember tonight. When Jesus was betrayed, was arrested, was scourged, and was killed. From the beginning of time, from Genesis chapter 3, God put this plan in place and he set it in motion. And this point, this sacrifice of Christ, not a sacrifice for his country, not a sacrifice for his family, but a sacrifice for all of us. This is the center of all the universe. It's the crux of everything. It's the focal point of human existence. It's the greatest thing that has ever happened on this world. This time, I'm going to ask Jane to lower the lights. And if anyone here does not have a communion pack, and you wish to receive communion, they are by the door there in the back, and that would be the time. We're going to begin our readings, and we'll come to communion very shortly. From Luke 22, beginning with verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that you may eat it. And they said to him, Where would you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of that house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you to a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went, and they found it, just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. The Passover was a celebration of God's deliverance of his people from their captivity in Egypt. The traditional way to eat the Passover was fully dressed, with your shoes on your feet, with your walking staff in your hand, and ready to leave. Because as soon as God had performed the last of his miracles in Egypt, the Israelites would be set free, and they were to leave their captivity. And Jesus now is preparing to set us free so that we can leave our captivity behind. From verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread when he had given thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. 
For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them could this be? Jesus was sent by the Father for this reason, to put on flesh and blood, to live a perfect life, to satisfy the holy law, and then, at the appointed time, to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He was obedient even to the point of death, and not only death, but death on the cross, bitter and a curse. And because of this death and the resurrection that follows, we live in a new covenant that he has made available to us. And we walk in a new life that he has given us. We remember the disciples who walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. And they talked with him and he opened the scriptures to them. You know, we can open the Bible and read, but it takes the Holy Spirit of God to open the scriptures to us, to make us able to understand, to get the insights that we need from it. And Jesus opened the scriptures to them. And they didn't know who he was until he sat down with them and broke the bread. As we take this bread tonight, may we recognize that he is here with us, that he is opening the scriptures to us. Let's pray. Lord, as we receive this sacrament, we remember your perfect sacrifice offered once and for all. Lord, in anticipation of your second coming and in the joy of your resurrection, we still remember the difficulty, the hardship, the pain, the loneliness, everything that you accepted and everything that you endured on our behalf. And we thank you. We pray that you would help us to make ourselves living sacrifices to you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would make this to be for us the body and blood of Christ to strengthen our spirit and to unite us across all the lines that divide us that your people would be one. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do, and remember me. The body of Christ. The same man also, he took the cup after they had supped. He said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink all of you from it. <clears throat> as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again.
just like the Israelites. Jesus himself is ready now to leave the table as the Passover meal is eaten. He's spending this time with his disciples. He's giving all of his disciples that will follow us this sacrament to hold us until we're with him again. But what he's really trying to do is prepare for what's to come, and even more to prepare them for what's about to happen. But the disciples just don't understand. Luke 22, from verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Let's pause for a moment and reflect on that. that God gives to us. He has never failed to keep one. All of the promises that we make to him, have we ever managed to keep them? The burden of being alone rests heavily on Jesus he alone knows what he is about to face. His closest earthly friends are unable to grasp the coming sacrifice that he asks of himself, for them and for us. He knows that even if they did foresee the next 24 hours, the knowledge would overwhelm them. There is no help. There is no comfort. There is no one to share the burden with other than his father. And knowing that even that unbreakable bond will fail in the very darkest hour of eternity lends urgency to his need to spend time in prayer now. Let each of us remember to seek the Lord while he may be found. From verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat 
became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus himself has quoted the prophet Isaiah when he said, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. I wonder if Judas appreciated his situation. Having walked and talked with Jesus, having at various times eaten bread and fish and drank wine, all of which Jesus had miraculously provided. Having heard every word which proceeded literally from the mouth of God, he now will betray the Lord with a kiss. And he's just like every single one of us. Because all of us at one time or another have known Jesus' love, we have known his provision, and we have enjoyed his kindness. We have heard his words, and we too, at times, have rendered lip service to Jesus, while in truth, we're just doing our own thing. Verse 47. When he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were with him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest and to the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out, Have you come to arrest a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this, this is your hour and the power of darkness. There was a reason why Jesus urged his disciples to spend the time in Gethsemane praying. He knew the fear and the confusion that would engulf them as this evening progressed. He had hoped that they might walk through this dark place, relying on his Father. But he understands their weakness, and he understands ours. A lot of people in the past 12 months have walked in a dark place have walked in a place where their steps have been stalked by fear. I'm reminded of Elijah when his servant went to the window and looked out at the house and he saw all around him the army of the king of Syria 
surrounding the house. And he said, Master, what will we do? And Elisha told him to go and look again. And he prayed that the Lord would open his eyes to see those who were with them were more than those who were against them. And when he looked out, all the hillsides were covered with chariots of fire and the angels of God. Elisha didn't ask God to send them. He asked God to open his servant's eyes to see them. If you're walking in fear tonight, ask God to open your eyes to see that those who are with you are more than those who are against you. Because they're already there. Jesus understands their weakness and he understands ours because that is the very reason why he is submitting himself to what's to come. Luke 22 from verse 54. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat at the fire, looked closely at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The difference, I think, between Peter and Judas, both of whom have regrets for what they've done. But Peter went out and he wept bitterly and he cried to the Lord. Judas went out and he wept, but he didn't cry to the Lord. final act of God to set his people free from Pharaoh was the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt. Only those who had the blood of the Passover lamb applied to the doorposts of their houses would be spared. And now all the people of God will be set free from their bondage to sin by the death of God's own son. The blood of this, the greatest Passover lamb, must be shed in order for it to be applied to the doorposts of our hearts. 
Pharaoh's son died because Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God's son will die because God's heart is broken for us. And all the annals of creation, there will never be an act of love that can begin to compare. Luke 23, beginning with verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, the king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at this time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, then Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other from that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. After examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. And so Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. For 
for whom they had asked. And he delivered Jesus over to their will. So we come to that time as Jesus was led away, as we prepare to go our own way. Let's remember to watch with him for an hour in prayer as he asked in the garden. Let's remember to be aware of the time that he spent on the cross. And let's remember to wake up in the morning following the Sabbath and seek the Lord until Sunday morning then.